When I first looked at AI art about three or four years ago, it reminded me of a rather famous Gandhi quote, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you. But I actually did this the other way around. I looked at these images and I laughed and thought, well, I've clearly got nothing to worry about when it comes to AI. And then I kind of ignored it for three or four years. Well, that didn't mean that other people weren't particularly interested in what's going on. And some people got very excited about the early AI art, spending ridiculous amounts of money on some of the early images. Um, now, as a, an artist that's never sold anything for more than three or £400, if I was lucky, looking at somebody spending $400,000 on an image like this kind of makes you realise why artists end up lopping their own ear off. It was pretty depressing to be honest. So when I started looking at AI art more recently I was absolutely astonished to see that it had gone from generating nonsense images like this to creating images like this or this or this, or even this. And these images were being created by people in the AI community with uh, tools that allowed them to use uh, text to image generation. And they were creating these images from relatively short pieces of text. And that was all that was required for them to be able to eventually create these images. So I started having a look at some of these tools. I had a look at Midjourney and I had a look at what the, the community was creating. And as I started to look into it, it really came as a surprise just how much variation there was that people were producing images like animation and cartoon stickers Chinese ink, paintings of all different types. You could have specific styles of painting like cubism. People were creating ink drawings and illustrations. You could get paintings by a particular artist. You could get pencil drawings, tarot cards, vector artwork, wood carvings, uh, watercolors, photorealistic images. You could get photographic images, pop art, you name it, it seemed to be able to do just about every style you could possibly imagine. And the more I looked at it, the more I realised this, this wasn't just AI as an artist, this is AI as every artist, which was really quite astonishing. And as I got more involved and investigated more, what really became apparent was the rate at which the whole field is changing. It seems like almost every two or three weeks there's major developments, major new techniques, uh, such as things like outpainting or outfill, where you can take an existing image and then use AI to be able to generate what might have been outside of that image. And these techniques keep coming th thick and fast. We can do in-painting, content-aware removal, new techniques like text-to-video. It really does feel like every two or three weeks there's, there's something new to talk about. And like most conversations on the internet, the uh, discussion and opinions seem to pretty much fill out the entire spectrum that you would imagine. So at one end, there's a lot of people with really significant concerns about what AI art is, how it's been trained and what the implications are, whether it's cheating, whether people should ban it, all these sorts of things. And there's lots of examples of how people are reacting to it. So for example, Purple Port, which is a website I use for photographic models, has already decided 
to ban AI images on its website completely. And many others are having similar thoughts and similar conversations. And these sorts of reactions, if we think about that Gandhi quote, very much fall into the next category of then they fight you because clearly people are pushing back and reacting against what AI is doing, what it stands for and all these sorts of things, which is very understandable. At the other end of the spectrum, we've got people that are extremely enthusiastic about it. They see it as a, an amazing new tool, full of possibilities, all sorts of uh, opportunities, the, the way that it's helping to improve what they do, their workflow uh, and uh, how they use it. And uh, people like Scott Detweiler uh, does a lot of videos and some really impressive things about incorporating AI generated imagery along with really high quality photography that he does and blending the two together to get some really impressive results and if you're interested in that sort of thing I would highly recommend having a, a look at that. And then along that conversation spectrum there are all sorts of topics that have been coming up. Um, is AI sentient? Well if you have a look at the conversation of the engineer speaking to Lambda and the conversation that that produced you can start to understand how convincing uh, these things are in terms of you know the the Turing test can you tell whether that's a person you're speaking to or not uh, and I can certainly understand why people are having those kind of conversations um, should AI be taxed if people are taxed is it unfair if AI can do work and companies don't pay tax uh, are AI images biased? If you ask for an image of a CEO, do you get a white male? These sorts of conversations. Um, how did AI win an art competition? Uh, well, it was a digital art competition, but the, the judge didn't appreciate that the artwork had been produced by AI. Not only did they not know, they couldn't tell, and they thought it was the best image. So again, in terms of the Turing test, that seems to be passing a, a lot of criteria and raising some very interesting discussions in the process. And later in the video, we'll touch on copyright and style because these are really important topics that we'll dig into. But the one that I would like to pick up on first of all is this concept of AI being an amazing new tool because one of the things about a tool is tools are inanimate. You can put a hammer on the floor and look at it all day long, it won't build a fence for you. And you can open Photoshop if you don't press any buttons and move the mouse, it won't do anything for you. Tools by definition need a worker to actually produce something. And tools have always had a bit of a double-edged sword. So on the plus side, they definitely make people more productive. They can be very enjoyable to use depending on what it is. And they can definitely open up opportunities for people to be able to, to do things that they might not have been able to do otherwise. But they do have a downside. They can make jobs more repetitive and they do fundamentally threaten jobs because the simple fact is if you needed a certain number of people to do a certain amount of work if you have the right tools available you need a lot fewer people to do that same amount of work so potentially quite a lot of people have their jobs at risk and what tends to define that tends to be the market conditions so in a certain environment if you bring in tools and the existing market is fully served and there's no extra space then those tools will tend to to threaten jobs but if there's untapped market if the market can grow or if new markets emerge 
then actually you can end up with those tools stimulating the market and needing more people to use those tools to be able to fill that demand. And I think a lot of the creative industries over the last 10, 15 years have really seen that, where there's been almost insatiable demand for new artists and new content, new tools and techniques, both 2D and 3D. And the market has just grown uh, significantly and presented lots of opportunities. So in this area, uh, up until recently, uh, you know, tools have, have generally been a significant benefit. But the problem I've got is that AI is a worker, not a tool. And if you look at how business is using or looking to adopt AI, if you take something like a call centre where a customer might have a problem and they want to either phone up customer services or they want to get on the web and get in a web chat and chat away and tell them about their problems and get it solved. What powers that at the back end is a customer service representative, a person speaking to the customer or typing the answers back to the customer. And when you introduce AI tools, what you're not doing is creating tools that are to be used by those customer service representatives. So if you add voice assistant AI or an AI chatbot into this, these aren't going to be used by the customer service representative. These AI are going to talk directly to the customer. And the whole purpose for bringing the AI in is so that you can reduce and ideally eliminate the need for those people. That's fundamentally what AI is going to do. It provides you cost savings uh, because the AI ultimately overall significantly cheaper than having those people. Now that doesn't mean that people uh, or companies are not incorporating AI as a tool. We, we've already seen Scott incorporating it into his workflow and producing really impressive illustrations. And more recently, we've heard of uh, Adobe introducing yet more AI capabilities into Photoshop. And to me, that's not surprising because Adobe and Photoshop are actually equally at threat as the artists are because if the artists get replaced by AI, the artists don't need tools. So actually AI is a fundamental threat to companies like Adobe and their business model for the software that they produce. And then we have things like Microsoft introducing AI as clip art and into search results and various things. And that's completely understandable because it has significant investment and ultimately will want to see a return from that investment. Now, if you're watching this video, you possibly already know me as Basement Picasso, uh, an artist that enjoys digital and traditional artwork and somebody that enjoys using tools that simulate natural media things like Rebel from Escape Motions. Now I've actually been doing art on and off for over 30 years, but I'm also a consultant enterprise solution architect. I've been working in IT for over 30 years, working in various industries, doing IT architecture, business processes and solution development for large systems within large organizations. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about where I think AI is going from an artist's perspective and how I think businesses will adopt these systems and use them going forward. So I do occasionally do uh, traditional painting. I do oil painting. These are uh, A2 in size, they're oil on canvas on board, 
And paintings like that typically take me about six to 20 hours to do, which is reasonably quick. Some artists will take weeks, months, occasionally even years to do a single oil painting. So I'm, I'm a, consider myself a reasonably quick artist. And similarly, I do digital artwork and images like these ones would typically take me between three and eight hours to do. Not quite speed painting, but certainly in the overall scale of things, again, still reasonably quick. And one of the reasons that I'm reasonably quick is when I first started out back in 19 oat cake, when I was too young to realize that I looked like a complete idiot and frankly, too stupid to care. I actually started out in the comic industry. Now, you might not be aware, but in those days, the process for creating a comic was quite involved. Um, the green boxes show all the different people that were involved. So we had the art director, the writer, and a number of artists. And they produced two key artifacts in white, the story and the actual artwork itself. And then in the middle, we have the yellow boxes, which is the process steps that we go through. And it's a very linear process where somebody writes it, somebody draws it, somebody inks it, somebody colors it, and so on. And at each step, it goes back to the art director, they approve it, so they make sure they're happy with it, and if it's okay, then they pass it on to the next person. And in those days, because the artwork was still physical, it had to be posted from person to person. So each orange dotted line literally corresponds to next day delivery, the artwork being shipped from one person to another. For the record, I worked specifically as a colorist. So I literally got paid to do colouring in. So never let it be said that primary school doesn't prepare you for the real world. If we take that process and do a little bit of analysis on it in terms of how long that was taking, we can add up all the time and all the time it spends in postage and all the time that people were working on things. And what we'll get is the fact that that took something like 28 days, even for a relatively small six or seven page script. As time went by, various process enhancements came along. So new tools like Adobe Photoshop and others allowed the artwork to become digital. And as soon as the artwork was digital, it could be shipped much more quickly using email or Dropbox. So when we look at the process, once we had those tools in place, we can find out that we spend a lot more time and the overall process became much quicker. So if we look at that improvement that those tools had provided, we can see that we went from something that took 28 days down to 15. And this is classic business process improvement that happens all the time. This 46% improvement or as most of the process engineers I've ever worked with would say, twice as fast, would in normal big business be considered a significant improvement. People would be delighted with that level of uh, improvement in terms of how, th how long things were taking and being able to reduce the overall cost. But like all things, improvements tend to have a bit of an impact. And in the original process, when the artwork was physical, the magazines and the companies only bought the rights to the image, not the actual physical image itself. So that was returned to the artist. And that meant that they could go along to a comic convention like Kev Walker did here and sell it to somebody like me at a London comic convention for I think about 80, 85 pounds. And that was at a time when 
the going rate for a painted page was maybe a hundred to hundred and fifty pounds a page. So that extra revenue was significant as far as the artists were concerned. And of course, when all the artwork went digital, that was a revenue stream that was lost to those artists. So not only did they have to work to even tighter timelines because of the new digital tools, they were actually effectively getting less money for it. And we can see other instances of those sorts of challenges. Uh, there's a very good book on the artwork of Drew Struzan, who was a, a very well-known illustrator, has done a lot of covers and posters and artwork for movies over the years. And his book is chock full cover to cover with just amazing drawings <coughs> and and illustrations. I mean, he is a, an absolute legend in the industry. But the story that goes with it paints a really interesting picture because he talks about the transition of the early days when all this physical artwork was at its heyday and how he he was almost a movie star. He could walk into a movie set and command George Lucas's attention. He would stop and he would look at all the artwork and all the roughs and compositions and drafts that Drew had produced. And uh, he had this, this sort of significant status in what he was doing. But I'll read you a little section from, from this book because it gives a real insight into what the transition of these tools meant to an established uh, artist. So he says, as computer art for movies began to come into its own, my work began to drop off. The younger kids replacing the old guard at the studios had been raised on computers, not art school. They knew very little about movie history and had no idea who I was. They knew how to speak computer, but not how to communicate with an artist, any artist. They wanted more control. No way were they going to turn over a design or idea to someone outside themselves. At their worst, the old art director still had some art training or knowledge. The new ones were just go-betweens for the suits. Their decisions on poster art became guesswork based on what they thought would succeed financially. But they didn't know anything. So they defaulted back to some previous things that appeared to have worked before. Easy, lazy, everybody gets a salary and nobody ever has to think about anything. And the book goes on to really paint this transition of uh, a traditional artist finding it extremely difficult to be able to work in a new digital environment. Now, the first professional piece I ever did was actually a cover for the Judge Dread magazine. Uh, and obviously doing a cover is uh, a bit of an honour, a bit of a privilege. It's the first thing that people see. Uh, and therefore it's quite important. But where that becomes even more important is when artists are asked to do a book cover. And a book cover's interesting because it has to do two things. It has to summarise the content of the book and it has to grab somebody's attention to make them want to, to buy it. And if we look at the process for creating a book cover. It's similar to comics, but the main difference is it tends to be done more by a single illustrator and he'll have to go through a process of creating uh, thumbnails, uh, creating some roughs and creating uh, a final artwork and go through a complex process of discussions and approvals to try and come to a, an agreement on what a suitable image might be for, for that cover. And that's a process that might take something in the region of maybe two to eight weeks. And it's the sort of thing that somebody might get a fee, depending on how established they are, maybe in the region of one to five thousand pounds. So when we look at AI and some of the new software that's become available, 
There's a number of main programs. You've probably heard of DALL-E2, Midjourney, Stable Diffusion, and there are many others uh, all uh, under development and coming through. And the one that I spent most time with over the last few months was Midjourney. And one of the interesting things about that, as far as I was concerned, is it's barely got any interface to it at all. You literally have to connect it through Discord, set up a channel, add in the, the bot, and then you can effectively just uh, chat to the bot to, to be able to start creating some AI art. Now, if you're interested in the, the real technical details of uh, how AI is working and what the process is behind the scenes, the, the technical details, it's a very good uh, video uh, on the computer file channel which goes into uh, the real details behind diffusion and GANs and all this sort of stuff and how uh, that technology actually works which is really interesting. But for me I just wanted to use the program, try it out, uh, put some prompts in so with Midjourney you just type slash imagine, it asks for a prompt and then you can put in the words that you want, uh, as few or as many as you want to, to be able to create an image. So I thought I'd try International Space Station drawn by Leonardo da Vinci. And the process kicks off and what it does is generate an image out of a noise field, starts to refine it and within about 30 seconds you've got four little images that are returned to you. So you've got images one to four. And you get a little bit of an interface now where you can then uh, do two things. So uh, if you think something's close, but not quite what you're looking for, then you can ask for some variations. So you could say, take image two uh, and give me some variants of that. And it will redraw something similar uh, that you can then uh, iterate on. And you can repeat that process with those four new images and repeat that exploration uh, as many times uh, as you want. Uh, once you get something that you're interested in, you can upscale it and that will then give you a medium resolution image. And if that's something that you think is now working and you're happy with, you can then just click on it to get your final upscale and that will then go and give you a reasonably high resolution. A lot of these images are still relatively speaking quite small in terms of pixel size um, but that, that will give you the, the largest image that it can. So when I looked at this uh, in terms of what Midjourney was doing and I thought back to, to this book cover process it quickly became fairly obvious that the, the process is almost identical. Um, it's generating a number of thumbnails, it's doing some kind of intermediate rough and then it's giving you a, a final artwork and that's very similar to the traditional side of things where we go back to Drew Struzan's work in the sort of covers and posters. He would generate pencil sketches to ideate on what it was that they were going to do. He would then work through some colour roughs to flesh those out and produce a uh, uh, various colour images and then once the final artwork was agreed he'd then go away and do the, the really detailed final picture which would be ultimately the video cover, the movie poster or whatever it was going to, to be used for. So when I looked at all this the, the IT solution architect in me kicked in and I thought oh okay what would happen if we go back to this concept of a book and a book cover and if we took the story from a book, maybe we put that through something like a word cloud generator. We get a word cloud with the, the count of each of the words and then we use that in an algorithm to, to formulate a, a prompt. Uh, we can use weighted values because Midjourney can take weightings against each of those words. And then we generate a, a prompt uh, based on that text. Um, would that allow us to, to generate a book cover? 
So I thought I would have a little look at this. Uh, I went, I had a look and I found there was a, a website called uh, Project Gutenberg. Uh, it's got 60, over 60,000 free eBooks. So I had a little look at that and uh, I thought, uh, pick something that's nice, copyright free, so there's no issues, I can pick some text and have a play around with it. So I thought I would have a look at uh, Moby Dick. And uh, when I had a look at that and uh, saw what came up in the search results, in terms of the book cover, uh, I thought, well, that's, that's not particularly uh, grabbing my attention in terms of describing what uh, Moby Dick is all around. Um, but to be fair, given that this is a, a free ebook site that's uh, making its money through PayPal donations, then I'm guessing that they probably can't afford to do 60,000 book covers where illustrators cost £3,000 a time. That would be £180 million. So it's pretty obvious why they don't have um, high quality covers for their books. So I thought, well, let's have a play around with this, see see what we can do. So I took the, the book, I downloaded the text, ran it through this process, built a few pieces to do it, generated a word cloud and uh, played around with that and formatted a, a prompt that I could put into Midjourney and I thought, okay, let's see what we can do with that. So what I managed to do was take a book cover that had looked like this, and I managed to generate this, and this, and this, and this. Now I will say the AI was only doing the image. I added the text to make it look more like a book cover, but in terms of systemic uh, effort adding text like this to an image you can do in php in half a dozen lines of script so in the overall complexity of the system being able to add some text really isn't uh, a huge piece of work so i didn't think that was cheating too much and i thought that made it more comparable in terms of a book cover so i pulled together four images and just to show how easy this is I did another 10 and all of this had taken me a couple of hours including having to piece this together and write bits of codes and format things and download stuff so within two hours I generated 14 images that would have taken me weeks months and possibly never come up with this kind of variety of images and um, it, it just uh, it was absolutely incredible to me what what I was able to achieve in such a short period of time. So when I looked at this and, and reflected back in it what I started to realise was over the years I've studied dozens of artists, I've read hundreds of books I've attended thousands of hours uh, at art college or evening class or watching art instruction videos on YouTube or buying art instruction, you name it. I've definitely crossed the, the mythical 10,000 hours of practice, which makes me a, a, allegedly an expert, whatever that means. But reflecting on all of that, what I very quickly realised was... <coughs> This pales into insignificance compared to an AI that's trained on billions of images that knows about artists I've never even heard of and has a visual memory that is just orders of magnitude greater than I, I could ever comprehend. But the biggest realisation out of all of this is AI can create. I'd always taken these sort of AI systems to be just a sophisticated form of regurgitation that what you put in you get out in a slightly different format. But the more I looked at it, the more it genuinely feels to me through the AI and through some of these other things 
AI really can create. And if you look at what I'd put together in terms of a, a system and this process for creating uh, a book cover, what we'd effectively done is replace the Illustrator with Midjourney and added these other applications. And ultimately, we've got rid of the artist that might have got £3,000 fee. And at the time that I did this, given the costs for Midjourney and the number of credits, I was knocking these things out at something in the region of about 30 pence per cover. So that's 10,000 times cheaper, which is quite staggering. But it doesn't stop there because when I looked at this, these covers worked because I was really acting as the art director and I was making the decisions, directing the images, selecting new versions. And I don't claim to be a sophisticated art director, but if you started to factor in the costs of uh, an art director and how much they might cost and the time taken, even though the time they're investing per cover would be significantly less than dealing with a regular artist and all the communications and trying to explain what they're after and all this sort of thing, it still comes to a bit of a cost. And in fact, it's a cost that actually ends up swamping the, the AI artist. So when I was doing this demo and talk for, for some IT colleagues, I showed them how you could take this even further using emerging IT practices around agile system development. And what I showed them was what is being done in terms of the, the traditional approach to doing a book cover. It's very similar to a lot of traditional processes and traditional development in business. Um, it's based on uh, SME knowledge. So in this case, it's the art director trying to choose the, the right uh, book cover. It's all upfront design and all the decisions are done upfront because you have to choose the cover before it goes to the print run. And you have to make a lot of these decisions because you're making a big commitment. You're spending thousands of pounds to get this done. So you really want to try and make sure it's right. And that's why you go through this slow process of sketching things out and then doing colour roughs and all these sorts of things. Uh, and it's all based on this assumption that uh, ultimately you can create the best book cover through this big upfront process. Uh, and that's very uh, very consistent with the sort of traditional approach that you, you make these huge big decisions up, up front. But with the book cover, um, you never really know. And it touches back on what Drew Struzan was talking about with his movie posters that, you know, he had his ideas on uh, what worked and what was aesthetically pleasing and what would engage people. And he felt that decisions were making being made by people that just didn't understand these. But even then, it's still upfront decisions. And new techniques are really looking at changing that whole philosophy so that you can think about things in an agile way where you put forward a hypothesis. You think, well, this might be the best book cover. How do I find out if it is? Um, you, you look to test and learn and you look to make data-driven decisions. Um, and traditionally, this would be done with, you would have a focus group and you might do a few covers and you might get some people from the public and, and you would try and get a little bit of data, but it's very limited and it's a very expensive test to do. But with new system design and new thinking, what we can do is something called A-B testing. So I showed how you could incorporate this into a site like Project Gutenberg. Um, so when somebody comes in and they come in and do their search for a book, uh, we can see from the number of downloads, there's thousands, tens of thousands of people coming into these sites to download books. So it'd be very easy to take the next thousand customers and actually test and the way you would test it is you would split them up <clears throat> into groups of 250. You'd give the first lot the existing book cover that's already there. And then you would generate three AI images and you would give different sets of customers those images. And then you would measure how many people went through and downloaded the book. 
Now obviously these books are free, but you can see the principle if this was a paying site, if this was a, an Amazon or something where people were actually buying the book at the end of it, principle is exactly the same. And what you end up with is data on which book is at, which book cover is actually the best cover to use. So it doesn't matter what an artist thinks, it doesn't matter what the art director thinks, it depends on what's most effective in terms of engaging the public to, to select that book. And we can actually build all of that actually into the site in code and then work out which is the best cover and then make that the default cover that everyone sees. And now we know that that's the most engaging cover. It's been generated by AI and the art director has been replaced by code in the site. So what we now get is an improved site where somebody is able to come in, search for a book, click in a book of interest and then download it. And what's powering this behind the scenes uh, are all these tools uh, like Midjourney or other AI tools. And what facilitates this is the ability to have what's called an application programming interface between them. And this is where all these AI tools are going, is that they're opening these things up as a service that then becomes usable by anything else out in the application ecosystem. And this is how they're going to get used. They're going to get integrated at scale to solve problems where people need to generate not one image at a time, but thousands or tens of thousands or millions of images. That's how these systems are going to be increasingly used. And in this case, it would be very easy to put something at the front end to allow the site owners the ability to control the costs, which books use AI covers, which don't. Um, and you give them a very friendly ability to control what used to be the art director and the artists are now just fully incorporated as code into the site. In fact, you can do even more because AI opens up completely new value streams. So when somebody gets to a book and is just about to download it, it'd be very easy to set something up where you could offer them, instead of a free download, which they can still get, and given that this is a PayPal donation site, you could offer them for say, uh, a £4.99 donation, they could support the site and also get a personalised PDF with a completely unique one-off AI generated book cover. And that'd be a fairly simple system to put together where you generate four different images based on what we've been showing. You allow the person that's made their do donation to pick one of those four completely unique pictures and then you use a bit of software to put that cover on the front of the PDF and you let them download it. And as far as I'm aware, that's, that's a market that's never existed. That's a completely new market, which is understandable because at £3,000 a book cover, personalised book covers never existed before. So that's how AI can open up completely new markets. But unlike tools, that market is fundamentally fulfilled by the AI. There's no need for people. So these markets allow people to incorporate things, but they don't open up opportunities for artists underneath that. And that's clearly a huge concern. And if we look at it from a cost perspective, looking at what this site uh, was potentially going to cost, um, even if we factor in that they wouldn't do covers for every book, um, you're still looking at something like 57 million. And yet we could do this using this digital AI system, probably for something in the region of 54,000. And as I said, these costs are going to come down significantly as these tools emerge, become more established. But even at that, that's a monumental saving in cost. So we spoke earlier about 
uh, being able to do things uh, you know, 10,000 times cheaper for a single image. With this we're doing at scale and getting a thousand times cheaper overall. And with that new value stream, you could actually even get that money back. You would only need 14,000 donations. And bear in mind, this is a site that's getting probably millions of people every year. Um, that new revenue, revenue stream could even pay for itself. So what does this mean for uh, other creative industries? Um, so if we think of IT and um, architecture and software development and those sorts of things, uh, if you ask Midjourney to imagine a data center, uh, it comes up with a pretty credible image. It's a, maybe a, a little bit sort of um, futuristic, but actually uh, a lot of people would be quite happy to accept that's a, a picture of a data center. But if you ask it to come up with a business process diagram or a solution architecture or anything technical, then uh, it produces something that's visually interesting but logically utter incoherence. And if you look at that and that brings a smile to your face, then again, we would go back to the Gandhi quote in terms of uh, back to then they laugh at you. Because the, the simple thing is that AI is domain sensitive. Uh, it, there's no, no general AI as yet. And Midjourney is uh, trained on billions of images to be good at producing a, a visually pleasing image. That's ultimately what it's trying to do. It's not trying to produce something that's logically coherent. Um, but what happens if you take AI and you train it on billions of lines of software? What you get is something like Amazon's Code Whisperer. And once you've connected Code Whisperer to your software development environment, then you can type in uh, a simple comment in natural language. So not software, this isn't code, this is simply uh, a natural English uh, line of text explaining what your software is about to do. And within six to 10 seconds, Code Whisperer will return the software for you. Uh, sometimes even give you three or four options so that you can pick which is the best bit of software you want to use. Now, I've done enough software development over my many, many years to know that that is not code completion. That is a junior software developer on 13 cans of Red Bull. Now, if you're starting to think this all maybe sounds a little sci-fi, far-fetched, uh, this isn't going to happen, it's all uh, a little bit uh, kind of out there, I'd recommend that if you want to dig into this more, go and watch a, a video by Dave Farley of uh, Continuous Delivery talking about Tesla and their AI capabilities and just how significant and sophisticated and scary their whole AI training process is. Because what I'm talking about doesn't even come close to that level of AI integration and development. So this really is how things are going to move forward at pace. These are significant bits of uh, technology that are going to be rapidly integrated at pace, at volume, at scale into these sorts of systems. So if we go back to our conversation about AI, we said earlier there's a couple of other things we might want to look at. Do you own your own style? <clears throat> And are there copyright issues? So I was recently reading a blog by James Gurney. Now, James Gurney is an absolutely incredible illustrator, probably aware of him. 
uh, who's somebody I've certainly looked to in terms of my art career and development. I bought both his books, which are absolutely superb. Uh, I, so I was interested to, to see what he was talking about and uh, seeing when it came to AI. And uh, I was quite surprised to, to see what he was talking about in terms of style and the fact that he thought artistic styles can't be and shouldn't be copyrightable. And that was quite an interesting perspective. It's actually something that I, I think I fundamentally disagree with. And I think for me, you need to step back a bit and think about what it is in terms of a, an image and potentially exactly what AI is stealing. So if you have an image, when it comes to copyright, copyright is protecting that image in its exact form. You know, it's a sort of pixel for pixel replication in another uh, medium or mechanism or place. So somebody taking your image and sticking it in a magazine article uh, without paying you or asking your permission is a breach of copyright. And ultimately, that's not what AI is doing. AI is not giving you an exact pixel for pixel representation of somebody else's artwork. So that's one of the reasons why a lot of the, the copyright laws are really in a grey area because fundamentally in the first place it's not necessarily directly a, a copyright issue and it's also technically not a forgery because a forgery is about trying to make uh, a copy of somebody else's uh, typically original artwork and then pass it off as if it was that exact object and again that's not what AI is doing it's not creating an exact replica of something else and trying to pass it off as that thing. So it's not directly uh, a, an issue around a forgery. But for me, when I look at a style, I, I think of it in terms of visual language. And one of the things that I've been sort of working towards and trying to develop is a consistency and coherence from image to image. So whether you like my art or not, what I hope you can start to see is as you look from these images, there's there's a consistency in the marks, the style, the texture that start to make these images recognisable across a set of images. Uh, and that to me is is visual language. It's the, the style, it's the everything in terms of what somebody does, the, the way they compose things, the marks they make, the techniques they use, the colours they use, all, all the basics that you kind of learn honed into a, a set of things that work together that give you the, the ability to, to represent different things. And that visual language to me uh, is more significant than any one single image that you might have a conversation about the copyright of. It is the, in many ways, the culmination of somebody's artistic development to get to the point where they can produce images that are consistent and unique in that visual language such that people can recognise an image, even if they've never seen it before, they can recognise it as your image because it has that language and they can identify with that language. Uh, and that's a really, to me, important and really valuable thing that an artist strives towards. So I was really interested to see uh, Adam Duff of Lucid Pixel um, talking about something very similar. Uh, speaking about identity and identity theft and how uh, AI is effectively stealing uh, your um, underlying uh, uniqueness. So not just the individual images, but ultimately what, what you are and what you are capable of. 
Uh, and I, I think that's, that's much closer to the problem that, that we need to, to look at. And there was another very good video that I looked at um, by David Bruce, who's a composer and was talking primarily about music and AI generated music, but also touching on similar themes to, to what I've spoken about with the book covers. He was talking about album covers and using the album name or lyrics from the album and generating uh, art based on those and saying quite openly, you know, great for uh, composers that don't have a lot of money to spend, terrible for the artists that miss out on the work they would otherwise have uh, received. But he was talking about AI in the music space and it's not anywhere near at the same level that we are in the image space. Um, and this got me thinking in terms of this whole concept of copyright and AI theft and so on. And I started asking myself, you know, what, what would the music industry do? What, what would they do if somebody took the entirety of the Spotify catalogue and the entirety of Amazon Music uh, and anything else that they could possibly get their hands on music-wise and started generating, a, let's call it a Vivaldi, something that can do text to music and it's fundamentally built out of hundreds of millions of copyrighted songs that they haven't paid for, they've just harvested into this new music AI engine. And similar to what we're doing with the art, somebody could come along with a text prompt, type in a few words, uh, add in the artists that they're particularly interested in, and out would pop uh, a little music song in the style of, and possibly recognisable as having been created by that artist. Um, I don't know about you, but I'm fairly certain the music industry would be working out exactly how many zeros they're going to put on the legal case they're kicking off. There's no danger they would sit back and let anybody start to harvest their value in that kind of manner. I think that's part of the problem, is artists, visual artists, people that are drawing, painting and so on, don't have an art industry in the same sense to be able to protect them. We're kind of on our own um, and we're going to have to find a way to collectively actually try and do something from that individual basis. Otherwise, big tech is going to steamroller um, and there's not going to be anybody uh, it, to, to be able to, to stop it. And I think when you look at this whole concept of fair use, um, which is at, you know at the heart of this kind of grey area about copyright and uh, you know should people be allowed to, to use images. Um, I mean it's fairly clear to me within the, the context of being able to uh, look at copyright and the uh, exceptions to copyright and the sorts of criteria where you have to be non-commercial or it has to be very specifically for criticism of current events or teaching or helping disabled people, uh, you know, time shifting. All of these have very specific criteria about how and when they can be used. And these, the two sort of main criteria, the sufficient acknowledgement and particularly the fair dealing. So fair use in legal terms is actually called fair dealing and that's the ability to to be able to, to legally use somebody else's copyright. Um, and to me, the, you know, the fundamental criteria about, you know, does using the work affect the market for the original work um, isn't quite the right <laughs> phrase that we need to be able to challenge it because it's not about a single specific work. It's about any work that that person could possibly do, have done, or do in the future. Um, and if you look at it in that slightly broader context, there is absolutely no doubt that these tools are stealing the market for people's future revenue. It, that, that to me is, is just 
um, unquestionable. Um, and is the amount of work taken reasonable and appropriate? They've taken everything without asking. Um, how in any way can that be reasonable? Uh, and I think it's interesting, there was an article about uh, James Earl Jones, the, the voice of Darth Vader, uh, actually selling the rights for somebody to be able to create his voice using AI, which to me absolutely makes sense that, you know, to, to preserve that and be able to, to use that voice going forward, um, you know, AI will be able to, to do that and, and do that very convincingly. But they can't just take that and and then say, that's it, you know, we've, we've stolen this, we can now create any James Earl Jones text or any Darth Vader um, voiceovers and we'll now do that without paying for those rights and and that's what the the music industry and the film industry and you know big stars have that power and that leverage to to be able to ensure that they get those rights protected um, and that's that's what ordinary if I may call you that, artists are really going to struggle with. We don't have that celebrity value to be able to negotiate or fight for those kind of rights in the same way. And we've touched on the the challenges around this are, for me, they're not in the single image space. And I think a lot of the discussions on the internet, people are talking about, you know, somebody can produce an image in the style of so and so. That's not the problem for me. I'm worried about the ability for AI to generate thousands or millions of images in any style by any person. Um, and we've seen this coming through. There are people already, for example, generating uh, comics. The, there was a, a quite a good um, article and a good uh, video on uh, somebody that had pulled together uh, a comic that he, they had created out of uh, mid-journey uh, art. And that was still a very manual process. They were creating each individual image and and then piecing it together and making the comic for it. Um, but for me, that's just the tip of the iceberg. Once these systems are up and running and integrated, if you want um, a comic, you just feed the text in and it generates all the images. If you want a storyboard of a film, you just feed in the text, it generates all the storyboard images. These things will be done at scale and pace that quickly becomes unimaginable. And it's interesting to see the, the, the different responses to, to these, uh, particularly in things like the stock photography space, we're getting very different responses. So. Uh, Shutterstock uh, have gone all in and decided that they are going to sell AI images. They want to cash in and they're obviously taking the general principle that it's easier to ask for forgiveness than it is for permission. So uh, just push on and sell it and see what happens. Whereas you have somebody like Getty Images that have taken exactly the opposite position, banned them not because they are fundamentally against AI images, but because they absolutely recognise the legal difficulties of where these things are. And I think it's interesting for me if you go back to that Microsoft article uh, about uh, AI, the last line in that article uh, when Microsoft were asked about the fair use um, they declined to comment and that to me is a silence speaks volumes moment. Um, they know, they know it's not fair use um, and they're just going to try and work out how they're going to get around that. So for me, I think there's there's something in the future that needs to go way beyond copyright and uh, you know the basic protection of images um, and it needs to be more like the James Earl Jones sort of rights to 
a, a person and their style and their characteristics uh, as a whole. And I think there needs to be something uh, around two fundamental rights for, for artists. So one, I think, is the, the right to be excluded completely. Um, and I think that needs to be done in a way that uh, is uh, reasonable to the artist. So there needs to be things like um, either companies uh, can only use uh, artists' material if it is specifically granted, um, or there needs to be some sort of central register where artists can opt out at any time. Um, and possibly there needs to be something around automatic protection of new artwork for a period of time, say five to ten years, so that artists um, can benefit from the new material that they produce before it ever gets subsumed into anything else. Um, what we don't want are a hundred different AI companies that have all used your stuff and then give you crappy web interfaces and phone numbers and e emails and say, yeah, yeah, you can opt out. You just have to spend five days trying to work out how to do it for each individual one. Um, because that, you know, in terms of treating artists fairly, uh, just uh, is a mechanism that wouldn't work. And then I think there needs to be something about the right to be rewarded. So there has to be something there about the potential, assuming somebody has uh, decided to be included, then being able to get royalties. You know, you need to be paid for the, the material that's being used. Um, and that right needs to to be maintained until your work goes into the public domain. So something like, you know, the copyright, uh, something like death plus 50 years or something like that. Um, and that should even be inheritable. So it's part of your estate. You know, this is what, um, you know, people protecting um, the value of these sorts of things uh, is all about. And that needs to be, much like music, it needs to be done centrally and, and managed. It's not left to the artist to try and claim every individual use of their uh, individual pictures that were part of generating these these images. Um, <clears throat> And, you know, this, this kind of every use, uh, you know, it needs to specifically apply when people are using their names in prompt. That's fundamentally where people are directly trying to reuse that person's fundamental material. So, you know, there's a, there's a really strong anchor there to, to exactly what use means over and above their use of the general training within that, that AI context. So as I've looked at this over the, the last couple of months, I think what's become really clear to me is AI is this triangle of capabilities. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's the ability to create. Um, it's this huge body of knowledge that you know is ever growing and unlike humans, not something that AI ever forgets. It, it will only ever build on. And this ability to to do work, it's not a tool, it's a worker. And when you compare it to human workers, the speed with which it can do things, reducing 25 day processes to hours, if not minutes, doing, doing things orders of magnitude faster, in ways that can be scaled through cloud technologies vastly beyond what, what people can ever do. Um, it can do it at a price that's a fraction of what humans can do it for. Now, yes, there are big upfront costs to train these models. It costs hundreds of thousands, if not millions, um, and that you know, is prohibitive for certain types of, of training. But once these models are built, the reuse cost is incredibly low. We saw we got the cost of a picture from £3,000 down to 30 pence for a book cover that's 10,000 times cheaper. And that is just the tip of the iceberg as these things scale out. And then there's the quality. It is... Um, 
in almost every area we're looking at, whether it's art, whether it's uh, writing text, whether it is writing software, these things are, are working and operating at, at the level of a junior creator, at least already. And these things are only going to get better. They're going to get, you know, senior. They're going to get expert. They're going to produce stuff that is exceptional quality. Um, and that, that's only going to, to improve as we go forward. So as we look back at this kind of spectrum of conversation, um, I, I think at one end, there is absolutely no doubt the technology and the results it's producing and the capabilities of it are genuinely amazing. I find it amazing. It's uh, just been eye-opening uh, what AI art has been able to do. Um, but the more I look at it, the more I absolutely understand where people are coming from in terms of finding this concerning, finding it uh, upsetting, finding it potentially changing their outlook in terms of what they're going to, to do. And I absolutely resonate with that. Um, I've been considering for a while potentially a partially retiring, doing more art and trying to finally do a bit more of a career I wish I'd had time to do more of. And I genuinely find myself starting to, to question, you know, is that something I, I want to do? Is it something I can do? Is it going to change significantly? Could I make any money from doing that? So I absolutely understand that, you know, for particularly for, for younger people at the start of their career, this is going to be really challenging times. Uh, and I think it's really important to to engage with that and to understand that it is going to change what's going on and to look at it in terms of, well, you absolutely can't ignore it anymore. Um, you can laugh at it and, and try and pick holes in it. You can try and fight it, but ultimately there is no question about it. AI is coming it's going to be monumentally disruptive and the best way to steer yourself through these sorts of years is really to engage with that change, be really kind of aware of what that means and to, to try and adapt to it, incorporate it and look for the new opportunities that, that will come out of the, the back of that. So if you've made it this far, um, I can only thank you very much for listening. Um, I hope this has been interesting. I hope it's been as unbiased as I can make it. Um, I've put quite a bit into this. There's a lot of information, a lot of links in the description below if you want to follow up on any of the material that I've talked about. Um, if you've got thoughts or comments, I, I would really like to, to hear what people are thinking. Um, I understand it is a difficult and a scary topic for a lot of people. It's a, an emotive topic. So I would ask people, you know, really to bear that in mind in terms of the, the way that you, you talk about it and the way that you react to, to other people. And if you're finding it um, difficult to to deal with in terms of what the implications are. I hope this video has helped give you a bit of insight into the broader picture in terms of where these are going, whether that puts your mind at ease or not, I, I don't know. Um, but I've tried to put this together uh, in a way that helps people more deeply understand uh, what the impact of some of these things is going to be because I, I believe in a, a for, forewarned is forearmed kind of approach. I don't think this is something that we can bury our heads in the sand and make it go away. So the only option is to, to really kind of double down on it and uh, 
try and try and engage with it uh, and try and uh, work our way through it. So thank you very much for listening. Um, I look forward to seeing you next time.